Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 14. Christmas time always reminds me and the Bible does a good job of reminding us that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And we're going to see an example today where that was the experience that his disciples had, that Jesus really was with them, and it was in the middle of a storm. Uh, not a Christmas message. I'm saving that for New, uh, Christmas Eve. Uh, but Emmanuel is with us, and here's an example of that today. And I, I, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know every need. I know I've been on the phone quite a bit. I know I've been reading emails and such, but people have been going through some storms. And the world itself is in the middle of a storm, isn't it? And until it, until it bows and worships Jesus, it will continue to be in a storm. But what's amazing is, is we as believers can be calm and can get through the storm of this life or even our own, because Jesus is Emmanuel with us. And this setting of our scripture today is extremely important. How many of you know when it rains, it, doesn't it? I wish it didn't, but it does. And the setting that we have in our story is that the disciples had just heard that John the Baptist died. He was beheaded, he was persecuted and beheaded for his teachings uh, about Jesus and repentance and coming to God. And so the disciples went and got his body and buried him. And then they told Jesus earlier on in Matthew 14 that he had died. And Jesus tries to get alone to be with God, most likely to grieve. Because if you're not aware that we believe John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin, so a family member of his passed away, died. And so Jesus wants to get away, but the crowds of people that Jesus had been ministering to for some time had followed Jesus. And instead of grieving, he had compassion on them and began to have a healing service instead. And the healing service went long and people were hungry. And there was over 5,000 people. And the reason why is the... Uh, we know that is because the Bible only counts on uh, the, the men in those situations because the culture at that time only counted the men. And then the women and children were not counted in. They were just families, right? So basically, we're talking about 15,000 plus people in this crowd. And so this is a large crowd. And Jesus hosts a huge potluck. Anyone been to a potluck recently? It's good. Problem is... There was only five loaves of bread and two fish. That's not going to cut it. There's nothing worse, by the way, than going to a potluck and there's no food left by the time you get up to that table. You ever been there? You know, you're like, I'll be last, you know. And, oh, yeah, there's, I should have got up there sooner. It's, it's empty. Um, well, Jesus multiplies this young boy's gift and feeds everyone and there's leftovers for every disciple, a basket full of leftovers. And, you know, that's a long day of ministry on top of thinking about how your cousin was beheaded and killed and buried and gone, uh, not getting time to get alone. And what does Jesus do? Jesus doesn't get alone yet. He actually sends the disciples ahead to get alone. Then he gets the crowd to go away, dismisses them. Then he finally gets alone to get alone with God and pray. And I also believe to grieve because Jesus was human, wasn't he? And it was in that moment of hours of being with God that a crisis hit his church, that a crisis hit the family of God. His disciples were in the middle of a storm in the Sea of Galilee or also known as a lake and Jesus stops his prayer time with God and now meets them in the middle of their storm. Now, I don't know if that sounds like your life recently, where it just seems like when it rains, it pours, 
or when the responsibilities of life don't quit and you never get a chance to slow down and process things or help other people or to grieve, to get alone with God. And it's hard, isn't it? Jesus teaches us some valuable lessons in this. Uh, We learn some valuable lessons on how to get through our storms. And so that's where I want to bring us today. So Matthew 14, verse 22, it says, Immediately after this, after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were excited. Just making sure we're all here. They were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! (laughs) But Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid, take courage, I am here. Let's just pause for a second. What are you going through? God has a message for you today. Do not be afraid. Take courage, I am here. Don't forget that. It's in the storms of life. It's in the heavy waves and waters and the troubled waters that we quickly forget those promises. Do not be afraid. You have nothing to fear. Instead, be courageous. So don't just not have fear, but now be full of courage because I am here. And maybe you just need to hear that today from Jesus himself remind you, he is with you. Then Peter asked a crazy question. Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Wow. That's his zeal and passion. That's, uh, he's, the, he's the guy who kind of gets himself in some really interesting situations of the pack. And Jesus entertains it and says, yes, come. Come on out. Now, I want you to know something. Um, When we have some crazy faith ideas, just because you have one doesn't mean it's blessed by God. Jesus enables him to come out and walk on water. That was not Peter's power. That was Jesus' power given to him because of his faith. And it's important that we also give credit to God. We cannot do anything unless God gives us the enablement and the grace and the power to do it. And it's because Jesus gave him that that power and authority to walk on water, he was able to do it. My friends, move forward in life when Jesus gives you the power and the enablement to do it. And trust that he will. Trust that he will because it takes that faith to make it happen. So let's keep going in our story. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord. Don't we all do that? Things are going good. We're worshiping. You know, we're reading our Bibles. Things are going great. And then we look at the storm again and everything's bad again. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And what does he do? He says, save me, Lord. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. And then he does something that you just kind of think there's a better time for this. In the middle of the storm, Jesus rebukes Peter. Right? Like a little correction and rebuke meeting. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. Now, friends, uh, in scripture, this is a real storm. This is not a metaphor. This is not a fable. 
this really happened. The lake or the Sea of Galilee that they were in was nestled between two mountains that would often have uh, storms because the wind would come over the mountain and it would be funneled tightly and hit the water and cause major waves and storms and still happens today in that area. So we know that this is possible and it's important that we know the bottom line that, that we're supposed to take from this is that Jesus has all authority, dominion, and power over creation. That he has the ability to calm real storms. And maybe some of you have been through some, and only you could say, the only thing you could say at the, at the end of it was, that's God that I got through that. Right? That's God. And maybe you've literally been through some real storms. And God has shown up and protected your family. I've heard stories over the years, I have my own, where I've watched God deliver me or my family members from accidents and things like that, because God has the power to do that. But it's also safe to, to look at this scripture as a metaphor for life's storms and a variety of those. Even the Full Life Bible Commentary says this, in the ancient Near East, the sea was the dominion of chaos and destructive forces. Already in the Old Testament, the waters were viewed as dangerous and destructive, and God is the one who overcomes the waters and waves to preserve life. First century readers in Matthew's day would react or read this event and apply it to the storm and waves of persecution they were facing against the church. So that's how Matthew's readers in the first century would see this story is it wasn't just a physical storm, but that Jesus would be with them in the storm of persecution. And I don't know what you're going through today, but I think it's safe to apply it to all kinds of storms. Persecution for living faithfully to God's word. Overwhelming challenges and circumstances coming down on you all at once. We could apply it to the storm of worry, relational conflict, financial burdens, the loss of a job. There are many situations that could correlate to this storm. The good news is Jesus calms the storm and the disciples worship with joy. But it wasn't that easy first, was it? Let's look at some things we can apply that we can take away for our own life. Number one, we can't avoid every storm in life. I think we should be rejoicing. We heard a word from the Lord today to rejoice. Okay, I want to be real with you, and God wants to be real with you too. We can't avoid every storm in life, just so you know. Because we're not sovereign over physical storms or trials we go through. In fact, it's best that you try not to control or fix the storm. It's best that you look for God in the storm. And here's why. You're going to face storms when you are doing what God says to do because the enemy hates that. He doesn't want you to, to do the things that God has called you to do in life, to obey his word. And then some storms are self-inflicted by the unholy choices that we make, and now we have to face the consequences of those choices. Some storms can be direct tests from God to develop us, but I also think God allows everything to happen to us for our good for a greater purpose and plan in the storm. Sometimes it's not a storm because a roofer dropped nails onto the road in your neighborhood and now you have to pay for a brand new tire. That's just life. I'm saying that from experience. <laughs> However, how you respond in front of your kids or your family or the next time you see the carpenters and the builders in your neighborhood is important. So Jesus and God can use anything in your life to teach you something. And I believe that Jesus uses this storm, this trial, to teach and develop his disciples. And he also uses ours to do the same thing. And the next lesson we learn is that we can't avoid every storm, but guess who's in every storm? God. God, believe it or not, is in every storm. He is the God of peace, okay? But he's also peace in our storm. 
The disciples found themselves in this, but they also found Jesus there. And what blows me away is that Jesus actually does call Peter to come out into the storm. Couldn't you have had your Sunday school lesson in the boat? That would have been kind of nice. No, he calls him out into the storm. Now, thirdly, he doesn't necessarily deliver us the way we want him to because God doesn't remove storms. He uses them to develop us. Wouldn't it have been nice if that storm never happened? That would have been great. Why didn't Jesus calm and silence the storm? Because Jesus wanted to teach the disciples who he is, what faith in Jesus can do, and to always keep your eyes on him. It's in the rough seas of life that test our faith, that has tested my faith, and we learn new levels of God's faithfulness and power. You know, a lot of times we don't see the end result through the storm, but when we get on the other side, we get to revel and rejoice that God saw everything. His vantage point is up here and we're here, but he sees everything. He sees the end. And when you get to the other end, hindsight is what? 2020. God already has 2020 vision. We don't when it comes to our situations. It's in the middle of the storm that he's developing our faith to trust him that he's doing everything for our good. Now, Jesus spoke to Peter and the disciples in the middle of the storm, and God will do that for you, and he wants to speak to you through this in the middle of your storm. Okay, that's this, this is Jesus speaking to us if we were in the story, because Jesus isn't dwelling here, but his spirit, his Holy Spirit is with us. And when we're going through storms, I want to encourage you to get with Jesus to get with him in his word and let him speak to you. But I got a warning for you. Sometimes he's still gonna rebuke you in the middle of your storm. A lot of us want loving comfort and peace, but what did Jesus do? He rebuked Peter for his little faith. And it was a reason because he loves Peter. He's trying to develop Peter's faith because Peter is going to be the leader of this pack the leader of the church. He's gonna be the rock on which the church is built on. So he must learn faith in Christ. He needs to have the faith that can walk on water and he needs to spread that to everyone around him and be an inspiration so that the church will be strong and be able to endure the persecution coming. My friends, this life where we're living in right now, what we're going through can be training grounds for possibly greater persecution in America. And I know that doesn't sound fun, but it is a reality. And we're already facing that persecution. God will use storms to develop resilience and faith and trust in him. Because if he can get you through these smaller trials, he can get you through possibly bigger ones if you're still here on earth. Especially for our children, if they're still going to be here. And if our kids can see mom and dad handle storms with the grace of of Christ, then surely they can learn how to do it too. Didn't plan on going in that direction, but I did. (laughs) Jesus may have had followers with little faith, but he wasn't letting them stay that way. Jesus won't let you stay with immature little faith. Jesus utilized a storm to develop Peter's faith in him and teach him he could do the impossible. And let me ask you a question. Which way would develop your faith, calm seas or troubled waters? Troubled waters. The road ahead for the disciples would take faith that could walk on water. The road ahead for us or even today for the followers of Jesus Christ in America and around the world takes great faith. Peter would go on to be the leader Peter would go on to be the the rock on which the church was built. And we have to be able to grow in our storm so we can help navigate others through their storms. I saw this quote when I was studying and I thought this was fitting. No one becomes a skilled skilled sailor sitting in the harbor. We don't. And God knows that. I'd rather God take every trial from my life. That would be amazing. But then the reality is life is not without their trials. So I, don't, I wouldn't know how to handle them. And I would be right back in the same spot. 
And then as a pastor and shepherd, I would know how to help comfort you and help you. And then you wouldn't know how to help comfort people around you. You wouldn't know how to help someone who's lost in sin and doesn't know Jesus how to get through this life. There's purpose for your trial. There's purpose in storms. God wants to develop your faith. He wants you to learn who he is and what he can do. It's the hardest lesson. As Jody always says, it's adversity university. It's true. And whether you like her or not, you're enrolled. But the cool thing is, is Jesus is your professor. And he's showing you and helping you and, and wants you to know he is with you in the middle of your storm. Now, there's good news to this story. I don't know if you saw it, but it says, verse 34, after they had crossed the lake, they landed at Gethsemane. They landed. Yay! Maybe you're like, am I ever going to land? This trial's going on forever. I have good news. God knows how to get you to the other side. He is the captain of your life, I hope. He is the captain of your boat. He knows how to get you to the other side. But you must trust the captain of your life. He must be the Lord. I personally live with hope and peace and joy. It doesn't mean I don't run out. Trust me. I'm not up here perfect. I'm not up here saying I never have really hard days, you know, where I stay in the boat and let someone else jump out in the water. I have my days. Ultimately, I have peace and joy knowing that this life is temporary and God is getting me to the next life. Whether it's Jesus returning first or whether I pass away because of whatever happens in this life, I know I'm going to get to the other side safely. Amen. It would be nice if it was simple, smooth sailing. It would be nice if we had no problems on the way there. But because of the fall, because of the fallen world we live in, we are dealing with the consequences of sin. And so the only thing we can do is to hold on and cling on to Christ to get through it. Maybe some of us have been looking for the horizon more than others lately. Looking for the return of Christ a lot, haven't you? Have you seen the studies that have been coming out that even unbelievers, unchristians are saying they feel like they're living in the end of the world? It's been posted many times in recent weeks. Even the world, when they're surveyed, is saying it feels like it's the end of the world. Well, hold on, because it's not yet. It could happen soon. We see signs. Now, here's the thing for the church. The church, we need to be able to navigate our own storms, but also help pull people in the boat now. There's room in the boat. And sometimes it's going to it's going to challenge you to no longer be afraid of your trial or storm and to get out of the boat and bring people in, rescue people out of the water. Because the storm that's coming, the judgment of Christ that's coming is much worse than what we're going through right now. And I want everyone to be ready that is possible, everyone possible to get ready. There's another beautiful moment in this story. We worship the Lord who walks over storms. They worshiped Jesus. They said, you really are the son of God. And as you can imagine, this was joyful worship because the waters had calmed and they were safe. But it's also because their hearts had witnessed God's son rule over creation. Did you know that you worship the Lord who walks over storms? Did you know that the one who walks over storms walks with you? That he is greater than any trial, any circumstance, any storm. He walks over them. Amen. That means he is greater and triumphant over every trial that you have. Now again, he doesn't remove us from the storms. He develops us. Let me illustrate that for you. Mark 4, 35 
through 41. How many know this wasn't the only time they were in a storm with Jesus? I wonder if they like didn't want to travel with Jesus anymore after this one. You know, every time we're with you, we get in some storm. What's going on? Maybe they didn't learn their lesson yet. This is earlier in their chronological journey with Jesus. It says in verse 35, as evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross the other side of the lake. It was the same one, actually. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. Yeah, that was funny to me too. So we have Jesus who walks over storms. Now we have Jesus who sleeps through storms. So you worship the, you, you're up all night, you know, not at peace. Jesus is sleeping. No, I'm sorry. No, he's, he's always awake looking after us. That's funny though, isn't it? Hello, Jesus. How's that pillow feel? The disciples woke him shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Have you ever felt that way? Come on, is this speaking to you? Can you relate to the disciples? I've been going through this thing for years. Are you sleeping? It's okay, be human. Of course he's not. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. You know, if we're not careful, we don't see the faithfulness of God because we do focus on the storm so much. We can take for granted even the simplest things. Like I got up and I could breathe. I got up and I have a house and a roof over my head. I got up and I got to see my family today. You know what? I even got to hear you know, my kids whine and complain. I'm going to find joy in that somehow. You know, we, we go through things so much, the cloud of, and the storm is so thick, or we let it be that way. Instead of putting our eyes on the goodness of God, what a great song to sing. He has been good. He's been faithful all my life. I want to encourage you to turn your eyes onto the Jesus who is at peace in your storm that will bring peace. Let's get back to the story. He does see you, just so you know. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, silence, be still. The same words, the same Greek words he used to rebuke demons out of demon-possessed people. So he's, he's exp expressing his, his power and authority over evil spirits his power and authority to multiply food, his power and authority to heal, and in this story, over wind and waves, nature. This is the God that you serve, my friends. This is Jesus, Emmanuel, who lives with you. He has this kind of power in your life, in your circumstance. Suddenly, the wind stopped, and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. Do you see the progression now? Do you see that this was how they responded? Okay, who is this man? And they learned a valuable lesson. They go through the lesson again, and now they say, you really are the son of God. Do not Lose the lesson in life that God is putting you through these things or allowing you to go through these things so that you will worship him as the son of God. Your faith was small, but it's gonna get stronger. And, and, and it's funny because here they really believe that he is the son of God. The first storm, they're still wondering, who is this man? Even the wind and waves obey him. Now they're saying you are the son of God, but Jesus still rebukes Peter for his little faith. You know what? We're always going to have to grow in our faith. But man, we need to worship Jesus as the son of God. They rightly discerned and divided that Jesus is the son of God. Sometimes it feels like God doesn't care. 
You're asking where he is, but just know that God is present. You know, there was a few words that were said to me recently that I need to say. Someone said, God sees you. And that hit me differently. God sees you. Don't take that for granted. That in the middle of the storm, Jesus sees them and comes to them on the waters. Nothing was going to stop Jesus from getting to them. Nothing's going to stop Jesus from comforting you. God sees you in your trial. He sees you in your worry, your fears, your anxiety. How comforting is it to know that God sees you? Can you just, just, can we just pause for a moment? I'm being serious. I'm not trying to make this over dramatic. Okay, I promise you. Think about that for a second. Now, some of you might be afraid because God sees you, okay? <laughs> well, if he sees that and he's still there, it means he loves you, but he wants you to change. Repent, turn, turn from that sin. You know what? Be more aware that God sees you in all things. That's for your own good. But in your struggle right now, in your depression, your sadness, your worry, your fear, the drama, whatever it is, you need to know something. God sees you and he cares. And he's not absent. He's present. He's a call away. Lord, save me. And he reaches down and he's there for you. Sometimes it comes through his word. Sometimes it comes through another believer in Christ. Sometimes it comes through a worship song. Sometimes it doesn't happen instantly. It takes time, okay? I talked about that last week, that we gotta get alone with God and, and not just rush it. We, we live in a microwave society when everything's done, you know? But we can't do that. Sometimes we gotta wait on the Lord so he can renew your strength and then you can receive what he's supposed to be sharing with you. Sometimes we have to wait on the Lord to change our circumstances so we can even receive the peace and the message and the hope and the love that God has. Sometimes we gotta wait and wait so he can teach us different things. How about this? What if God's teaching you to wait? What if God's teaching you to get back into his presence? Okay, let's, let's, get, let's get there soon, but let me finish with one more point. I wanna encourage you with something today. I really feel like this is important. You know, I could have left this out for time's sake, but I need to leave it in. Leave the harbor and step out of the boat. Now, I put both of those in there because some of us, we haven't even left the harbor. Forget about being in a boat in the middle of life. I'm not stepping out. I'm not doing, I'm not, I've been through enough. I don't even want to risk doing anything for God. I don't want to make any new friends. I don't want to reach people because there's a storm on the other end of that. So I'm just going to go ahead and stay on the harbor. I'm going to hang out in my house, right, and avoid everyone. Now, look, I don't know what you've been through. Maybe there's a time for that. But I don't think that God wants you to live life that way. You have been saved and transformed to be the light of the world. And the Bible says, do not hide that light. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. So at least kick off the harbor a little bit. Push away from the dock. Come to church. Let's try that. Right? Get with someone else and pray. Read the Bible. Put your heart out there again a little bit. I know it was crushed. I know you're afraid. But trust God that he's with you. And then he's calling us to do some hard things, church. He is. His word says to do some hard things. But we're not alone. Step out of the boat, even in the difficulty of life, and do what God asks you to do. I got to tell you, Dorothy wasn't joking. Your generosity during this season, one of the joys of being a pastor during this season is to watch you not just give to your tithes and offerings every week, but to go above and beyond and give extravagantly. I mean, we had people coming in giving us cash to give to families in need for share the joy and for community gifts of 200 gifts. It was unbelievable. There was, we were praying for God to provide and then someone would show up 
Pastor John said that he was getting gifts at five and below, and the register, uh, the girl at the register asked, you know, what are you doing? He said, we're, you know, getting gifts for the community. And a guy overheard them, ran out, gave him 10 bucks and said, I want to give more. Pastor John, I guess he's not with the times. He didn't have Cash App, Venmo. He didn't have all the digital stuff. That's right, I only have one myself. But, uh, you know, he didn't have a way to collect any money from him. And so he, he went, he's like, can I call the church? He calls the church with Pastor John right there in the parking lot at Five Below and gives our church $250 to help kids in need. Like, what? It, it, that's just one of many stories. There will be tears in the NPR this week as we give out these gifts to families because there was no hope. We had a room full of gifts in the back here right now to give out to kids and their families to help parents have a Christmas. I'm telling you, church, it matters. That, for you to go through what you're going through and still share the joy, like I said last week, to still refresh others and you will be refreshed, don't be afraid to trust God. Step out of the boat. And I'm not just talking about giving. I'm talking about anything. He wants you to live life. You know who doesn't want you to live a life that's full? Satan. And so we haven't even talked about that. But when you do the will of God, he will come against you and he will throw things at you and it will feel like a storm. But Jesus is Lord over every storm. He is greater and has more power and authority over the enemy. He will provide the strength. He will provide the love. He will provide the finances. He will provide the peace. Trust him. Step out in faith. Let him teach you. We've been learning things through this message. I'm sure you have learned a lot about God's faithfulness because you've been through some storms. I'll close with this question. Is Jesus Lord over your storms or do you try to handle storms on your own? Stop trying to handle them on your own. Jesus is literally there. His spirit is there. His word is there. All the worry isn't going to change a thing. All the fear isn't going to change the result. It's not going to change and be a solution. You must look for Christ in the storm. And I got news for you. He may ask you to come out further into it. Remember the setting. This, is, this spoke to me as a pastor because, you know, we, we deal with our own losses or grief or, you know, one moment we're, you know, we're grieving with people. The next moment we're having a great church service. The next moment we're having a potluck or a miracle takes place like, like I was saying right now. And then you try to get alone and pray and then there's a crisis in the church or in a family. Sounds like a pastor's life. Sounds like your life too, right? When it rains, it pours. Jesus did something that spoke to me, and I pray it speaks to you. In the craziness of that day, he still got a way to be with God, and he's Jesus. Like, does he need that? He wanted that. He wanted to be with God because he loves God. And yes, he's human. In this time, in that moment, he was human. He was fully man, fully God. So he needed to recharge with his father, to depend on the Holy Spirit. And church, one of the best things you can do when you're going through a storm is to silence the noise and get with God. To get with him and let him speak to you. You may feel overwhelmed. The feelings can be so loud and so heavy. But I got good news for you. You won't be overcome. The waves did not overcome Peter. Peter. He walked on water. It was when he allowed the feelings and the circumstances overwhelm him that he began to sink. But even when he began to sink, Jesus was there. Jesus is there for you. This is such a broad message. I can't give you specifics of my life or other people's lives because of the storms that they go through. But you know how to apply this to your message or to your life from this message. You know what to do with it. Let's pray about that. Let's pray that God helps you. And you know what? Maybe you're not going through something. Guess what? Now you know what to do. Now you know who is with you, and you know what to do if you go through something. Jesus is Lord over storms, over your storm. 
That's who you worship. High and lifted up above all things. He's got you. Amen. Let me stand together as we pray. Afterwards, we'll, our prayer team will be down here to pray if you have anything. And we're going to do that right now, too. We did it in the first service. We're going to do it again. Right where you are. And afterwards, there'll be prayer team members here if you need prayer for further. Right where you are. If you're going through something or you're standing in the gap for someone else, you want to pray for them, would you raise a hand? Nice and high. Yeah, see? There it is. I mean, I got so many messages last service already that I needed this. Well, guess what? God hears your prayers. So with your hands lifted high, okay, if people around them, could you just, if it's okay, can they put a hand on your shoulder? We're going to be the body of Christ here for a moment. Go ahead, slip out of the pews. Let's begin to put hands on shoulders and begin to pray for the Holy Spirit's presence and help in these situations. God, we come to you right now. God, we trust you with our storms. God, sorry for trying to be Lord over my own storm. God, I put you back where you belong. Jesus is Lord over the storm. I can't control the outcome. I can't control this storm. It's out of my control. God, I surrender to Jesus as the captain of my life, the captain of this boat. And God, I look to Jesus for love and correction and the peace and the guidance as needed as my captain. God, I surrender this worry and this fear, this, this circumstance that's so much bigger than what I can handle, but God, nothing's bigger than you. And God, I give you this trial. I give you this fear. I give you this anxiety, the paranoia, Lord, the, the worries that come with it, God. I give it all to you. Lord, the insecurity of not knowing what's going to take place or what people are going to think, I give it to you, God. I surrender to you knowing that you are with me, that your word will guide me. Your presence will see me to the other side. I trust you, Lord, and I will not be afraid to step out of the boat. I would not be afraid to do hard things for you, God, just because I've been through these things so much. I will let you heal me, and I will let you use me, God, so that I can be a comfort to others who go through storms, so that I can be a guide to get through those storms, Lord. I pray for peace in these situations, God. I do pray for an end in the trial when you're ready, God. I pray you would develop our faith through these storms, Lord. Develop our character. Develop our love for you. Develop our worship for you, God. I pray we would worship you now before the storm ever calms. So we'll know how to worship you in all circumstances, God. Teach us how to worship you. Teach us how to believe you in every circumstance. We are so grateful for the meaning of Christmas. We're so grateful for Jesus being Emmanuel. You are with us and your spirit is with us, God. We remember that today and we thank you. We rejoice that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We rejoice over that, God, that we are saved. Lord, that when you return, we will be in good hands, that we will have eternal life, God. We thank you for the gift of salvation and the gift of eternal life, God. We put our mind on you instead of the storm today. Lord, deliver, deliver, deliver us through these storms, Lord. And we will be careful to give you all the glory and to receive all the lessons that we're supposed to receive so that God will be ready for whatever comes next, whether it's our own or the people we minister to. Use us, Lord. And God, I pray for those who have been through it, that God, you would give them a powerful unction to help other people in need, that God, they, they would be by their side, that you would give them strength, Lord God, that it wouldn't bring up old things or trigger old hurts, Lord, but instead you would give them a, a zeal and compassion Lord, and the ability to minister to other people without it bothering them. God, give us that grace to do that. Lord, put people back into the harvest field again that have been hurt. Lord, restore them back to the fields. God, we need them in the fields. We need them in this world to be the light, Lord God. Lord, restore the joy of our salvation. Restore the presence of your light, the presence of Jesus Christ in us. And may we walk boldly into the storm of life, knowing that you are with us and we will walk over the storms with you. We give you all the glory and praise for the victory. Get us through this season and every season after, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.